Good evening. You probably recognize me from such television programs as Matthias Combs' Winter Gardens or everyone's favorite quiz show about birds, What's That Bird? But for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matthias, and I came to say this. I've got a big, bushy beard and kissable lips. And I carry all my fat in my ass and my hips. The rest of me is skinny as a stick. <clears throat> Can you do it? Do what? The clarinet part. Oh no, you can do it. No, I, That's I, I a really, great. I really can't. You... I, I look. Thank you, but I think for the sake of the viewers at home, you should probably play your clarinet part. I mean, most of music is just believing that what you played sounded good. So. <laughs> well, I definitely don't believe that what I played sounded. I should stick to the guitar. Right. I'll stick to the guitar just for this time. I promise I'll practice, and and next time, I'll, I'll get it. I mean. Okay, well, believe in yourself. I, do, I thank you. I thank you so much. But why don't you... you I'll do it. I'll do you it this show, time. show them how it's... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Much, much better. Yeah. In the 60s, my mom was hit by mini skirt and she was raised as a cat. Then she converted. She loved my dad's religion and she loved him too. And that's how I was born a Jew. Get hit by a bus or get cancer. But right now, all I am is a fabulous dancer. So, dance with me, baby, put your hands on my hips. Kiss my apple mention of kissable lips. Wherever we are, well, that's where we're at. My name is the Thais, and I came to say that. Welcome back to my collection, the show where I show you 
my collections. Today we'll be looking at part of my collection of souvenir tea towels. First on the docket is this tea towel from Sicily. It's a map tea towel. I especially like the map tea towels. I like to see all of the little drawings of different significant sites and different dishes or, or local flora and fauna on the map. I collect a lot of map tea towels. Another map tea towel I have is this one from the Orkney Islands. It's monochromatic, unlike the Sicily towel, but I really like these corner images of different wildlife that can be found in the Orkney Islands. Another variety of tea towel I enjoy collecting are wildlife tea towels. For example, I really like this Scottish wildlife tea towel. I think it's very beautiful. I also have just recently acquired an Australian wildlife tea towel. This was given to me by my aunt and uncle who live in Australia and it's very exciting because it shows off some of Australia's amazing wildlife and reminds me of them. Tea towels are useful around the house and they are beautiful and fun ways to remember trips that you've gone on and special places that you've been and special people in your life. I love to collect tea towels. Thank you for letting me show you my collection. If you're anything like me, there's nothing more thrilling than the last few days of winter. Spring is in the air, it's still cold and crisp, and the world just seems full of potential and possibility. And today I'm going to be going through some of the magic that can be found not in the winter garden, but in the woods all around us. Why don't you join me and see what we can find? A winter woodland like this one is a secret storehouse full of amazing things to eat. You just have to know where to look. Now all around me you can see the typical plants and trees of an Atlantic Canadian forest. But if you look closely, especially amongst some of the evergreens, you'll find a delicious minty surprise. Come over here. Now look, just here, what we have here is called winter mint. It's a lot like the, the typical mint that you would find uh, in, a, in a summer garden. A little more of a winter green bite. I'm at a certain time of the year, right about now, the woods are just full of this. Mmm, delicious. It's great for soups. Great with lamb. Mmm, can't get enough. As much as I love growing my own vegetables and fruit in my garden and going through the whole process of planting all the way to harvest, there's a magic to that. But there's something very, very special about coming out to the woods like this and foraging for the gifts that nature just gives us over the course of the winter. And this time of year, as I said, is, is really the perfect time for that. And in this situation that we find ourselves in right now, where we're all trying to make do with very little in a lot of cases, uh, foraging is a wonderful way to add variety to your table at a time of year when it might not be so easy to do that otherwise. So if you've got woodland like this around you, I really recommend coming out and if you find a spot like this where there's a bit of a clearing, uh, but you're surrounded by, by the woods, this is a very, very likely spot to find the winter carrot. Uh, I'm gonna try digging around right here. You do have to use your hands and I prefer to go gloveless because you get a better feel for the carrot. Uh, and I'm just gonna try digging around right here. Gets a little cold, but oh, there, I got lucky. There you go, that right there is a perfect winter carrot. And I really, it's freezing cold. It's like an orange popsicle, so I really recommend after you're done your winter carrot harvest, bring them inside, let them, 
warm up a little bit before you try eating one, because right now this is just almost like solid ice. But a delicious addition to the late winter table. Foraging allows us to deepen our relationship with nature, with the things that are all around us. Sometimes we don't even notice them. Take this birch tree, for example. You might know it as a simple birch tree, but it's more than that. And this time of year, all over the world, birch trees go through a very special cycle where they produce a fruit that we can eat. And if you just go out into the woods, you'll find it. This is what's called a banana birch. And if you look up here, you'll see there's a ripe banana just ready to be plucked and eaten. Look at that. Let's taste it. Mmm. No pesticides, no chemicals, all organic, grown right here in a winter woodland, just waiting for us to come along and have a taste. Neither did I. Wow. That I learned something new there. I love informative television. Me like too. Yeah. I think that presenter is really great. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> I like his corduroy jacket. I, he's very handsome. Yeah, very. <laughs> Spellbinding eyes also. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Um, enough about him. Enough about the presenter. <laughs> he is very charming. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> I think we're going to play a song now that is for Nancy, who requested it, and it's a new song that uh, we have recorded on a very limited edition EP, but otherwise hopefully we'll release at some point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a true story about Nigel de Gannett. And I'm going to try and play it on the little clarinet. So here goes nothing.
himself he was known by brain, and his heart was huge. So he chose a concrete paint, and he built her a nest. He figured it was what they wanted him. Just sat there and stared out to sea. When he died, Carl caught Nigel's tiny tombstones at the top. Here lies Nigel the Gannet, alone but never lonely. Oh, Nigel. Oh, Nigel. Rest in peace, Nigel the Gannet. So this next one is a song called The Things That People Make, Part 3, and it's going out to Alex and John, and it's actually not a song we have played very often. No, I was trying to remember it, maybe just a couple, handful of times. A handful of times. Over the years, yeah. Oh, in the early days of this uh, project, um, I used to write a lot of songs in, in pairs or in, in, in trios. I was kind of into the idea of of series um, of songs, and this was the, the final installment in, uh, in the Things That People Make series. This was like the, uh, I guess this would be like the Return of the King, uh, right? The Return of the King, Return of the Jedi, I think you mean. Uh, no, I was talking about the uh, Tolkien books, actually, Ariel. <laughs> um, and that's the third book, because we don't have The Hobbit, obviously. Okay. <laughs> Lots of returns. <laughs> yeah. This is okay, so this is return of the things that people make. Right? Yeah. Part three. Well yeah, and if you want to extend the Star Wars metaphor, it wouldn't be the return of the Jedi either, because it wasn't the third one. Wasn't it? No. Yes it was. Um, episode four, A New Hope. Return of the Jedi is part six. Yeah, okay, it's the third one of the original series, which well, is what we're... You don't have to get pedantic. <laughs> all right, all right, let's move on. In any case, yes. this is part three of The Things That People Make, and it goes like this.
three. Part three. Part three. You know? The, the rarely heard part three. The rarely heard part three. Where everything turns out okay in the end for Frodo and Sam and... <laughs> and Luke and Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, we're going to do one more song for you before we uh, get back to some of the other quality programming on COVD TV. We'll be back again by the fire a bit later. Uh, but this is, a, this is a kind of a sad one. It's going out to Sarah and Chris. And I think I'm going to pass the mic over to Ariel. Thank you, Matthias. Yes. Well, this song is about... I'm going to drop this uh, fake microphone. <laughs> yeah, just careful. Um, okay. Well. Uh, this song is called Eugenia Morris. And it's about the relationship between Maurice Sendak the author and illustrator of what, Where the Wild Things Are and his partner of, of many decades, Eugene Glynn. And it's a love song um, about two people who didn't let the world know how much they loved each other because it wasn't really always safe for them to do so. And yeah, so this is a celebration of, of love and it's going out to Sarah and Chris and everybody else.
and unkillable beast. And Maurice loved Eugene. And Eugene loved Maurice. Alright, that was Eugene and Maurice. And I don't know if you heard it, um, but halfway through that song, the cuckoo clock went off. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I heard it, yeah. You know what that means? Do you know what that means? It means it's time for... This! What's that bird? Oh! Uh, it's time for... What's that bird? That's going to be the segue. Oh, uh, that's a good... Welcome to What's That Bird, the show that asks questions about birds. We had a fantastic response to last week's episode, our very first episode ever done in quarantine, and a lot of you especially loved our guest from Antarctica, Paula the Penguin. A lot of you wrote in to ask whether or not Paula would be back this week as a guest on the show, and I'm sorry to tell you that no, we do have a policy here at What's That Bird that we only ever ask winners back to the show. Uh, and if you remember, uh, Paula was wonderful and charming, but definitely not the winner. Um, she ended the game, if I remember right, with zero points, which the judges tell me is the least number of points you can have or not have uh, in this case. Uh, so sorry to say Paula will not be with us this week, but we do have a fabulous group of new contestants, and I think it's time we meet them. First up, we've got Jess, all the way from Australia, one of the most exciting places a Twitcher can twitch. Welcome to the show, Jess, and tell us if you would, out of all the incredible birds down under, which one is your favourite? My favourite Australian bird is the superb lyrebird. And why the superb lyrebird, Jess? Because, as part of its ritual, the male builds himself a little stage and then performs a choreographed song and dance for the female. As part of his song, he mimics birds from the surrounding area as well as man-made sounds such as camera shutters and chainsaws and motorbikes. Amazing. It is amazing. Next we go over to Cardiff, Wales where we're joined by Fran in her back garden. Well Fran, looks like you're coping with quarantine well. Now as everyone knows, the majestic raptor the red kite is the national bird of Wales and the tiny little robin is the national bird of England. Tell us, Fran, how many tiny robins could a red kite fight all at once? One, two, five, or ten? About sixty robins. Sixty? Well, seems like a lot, but I trust you, Fran, you're the expert. Now we're on to our third contestant, all the way from Hamilton, Ontario, where he's coming to us live from his mother's basement, it's famed entertainer and self-styled showman on the skids, B.A. Johnson. Welcome to the program, B.A. Well, great. Uh, rumor has it that you've been branching out lately from the entertainment business, and you've written a children's book along with illustrator Paul Hammond called Gary the Seagull. Tell us about that. Um... I always wanted to write a book about my favorite bird, which is the seagull. So then I did, I wrote the book about the seagull. It made sense. Um, the world is ready for it. Well, the world isn't ready for much these days, but I think we're all ready for that. Now, as you might know, Gary is in statistically significant decline right now as a name for human babies. So why Gary the seagull? Uh, the seagull in the book is named Gary, mostly because um, it seems like the name that a seagull would have would be Gary. In fact, in Canada, we refer to seagulls as Garys, such as uh, there's a Gary on the car, honk, get it away from our car before Gary takes goes to the bathroom on our car. So normally, we don't even say seagull much. We would just say Gary's or Gary or 
flock of Garys more. Um, just we know what it means. Because it makes sense. Oh, it's a colorful Canadianism. I see. Putain, there's a Gary in my poutine. <laughs> anyway, BA, we have a special surprise that you'll appreciate a lot. And uh, for all of our viewers at home, too, please welcome, all the way from Yorkshire, England, it's Alan, the lesser black-backed gull. <laughs> Well, Alan, it's great to have you on the show. Now, is everybody ready? Let's play the game. What's that bird? Question one. Instead of a nest, this Antipodean chicken-like bird builds a large mound of compost and lays its eggs into it. When they hatch, the tiny chicks have to claw their way through a mound of stinking, rotting vegetation. Sometimes that can take hours, and when they emerge, Mummy and Daddy aren't around at all, and the chicks have to fend for themselves from day one. What is this freakish, unnatural thing? I mean, the answer to that is obviously would be a seagull, clearly. No, I'm sorry, that's not the answer we're looking for. <coughs> Good try, Alan, but B.A. actually just said the same thing. <gasps> it's the Malifowl! That's it! The Malifowl! Leopold Ocelata! and the only member of its genus, I might add. And that dirty bird just built you a nest not made of compost, but made out of points. Ten points, to be exact. Now let's move on to question two. This European bird employs a unique defense against its enemies. When a marauding raven or other ne'er-do-well tries to get at their nests, whole colonies of this bird will attack using precision-targeted poops. If their enemy's wings become too soiled with birdie business, they can be rendered flightless, not to mention the least popular bird at the ball. Could it be the Bassian Thrush again? But you just had that. Good memory, Jess, but no, I'm afraid we're looking for a different sort of a stinker. You know, there's one bird that could do that. Well, several birds could, but the answer would most likely be a seagull, or as we call them, a gary. I'm sorry, uh, neither of those are the right answer. A Darren Mice? Sorry, w one more time? A Darren Mice. Oh, of, of course, the Welsh name for the field fair, aka Turdus Polaris, and you're quite right, and this little bird has been known to cripple or even kill its enemies just by taking the Browns to the Super Bowl, as they say. And that's ten points to you, Fran. Congratulations. Question three. This South American bird, known locally as a guacharo, is one of the only birds in the world to use echolocation to navigate, just like bats do. It's also the only nocturnal, flying, fruit-eating bird on Earth. ¿Cómo se llama este pájaro misterioso? The kakapo? I'm sorry, no. The New Zealand kakapo is nocturnal, and it does eat fruit, but it is quite flightless. Some kind of swiftlet? Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not it either. Uh, swiftlets do use echolocation to navigate, so you're right about that, but they're insectivorous, they're diurnal, and they do not live in Sudamerica. Anyone else? Alan? B.A.? <coughs> Fantastic, Alan, and that's ten points to you. It's nice to have you on the board. I'm sorry, Alan, uh, we've really got to move on. I think that... <laughs> Alan, it's a wonderful story, but uh, why don't you leave us on that little cliffhanger and we'll move on to our fourth question. And first, uh, let's have a look at our scoreboard. We've got Jess with 10 points. We've got Fran in her back garden also with 10 points. We've got Alan, the lesser black-backed gull, with 10 points. And we've got B.A., last but also least, with uh, zero points. So B.A., this fourth question is your last chance to get things tied up and get on the board. And then we'll move on to a lightning round after that. Question four. There are well over 50 different species of this type of bird, including the Alrogs, the Belchers, the Glaucus-winged, and the lesser black-backed. 
The average Neanderthal non-birder, though, uses the same non-taxonomic word to refer to all of them. Ah. Uh. Yes, B.A., you are finally on the board. That's fantastic. Your persistence really paid off there. That means we're all tied up, and that means we have to move on to a lightning round. As you all know, on What's That Bird, a lightning round is exactly the same as the other rounds. Are you ready? What's that bird? For the win, Chili Willy, Tux, Mumble, Pingu, and Opus are just some of the fictional versions of this group of beloved, flightless aquatic birds. Oh, just one second, someone's at the door. Paula! phone has been ringing off the hook with messages of support from viewers like you. Thank you so much. If you'd like to keep our quality programming on the air, be sure to check out our Bandcamp and Patreon. This week, however, we'd like to turn our telethoning abilities over to some worthy causes. We are thinking this week especially about refugees and people in refugee camps, and we've uh, listed a number of organizations and some links here. Uh, to organizations that work and support those people. Um, it's a tough time for all of us, uh, and I know that budgets are tight, but if you have the ability to give right now, we hope that you will join us in, uh, in offering some support to people who are having a much tougher time than we are. Um, and now, you might as well learn a skill. So here is Nick Ferrio to teach you some useless guitar chords! Enjoy! Welcome to Useless Chords with Nick Ferriero. This week, we're going to cover three useless chords that you can try to write a song with, if you dare. I want to show you guys a few simple stretches that you can do in self-isolation to save your wrists, your fingers, from any harm they might get from playing guitar. First stretch, it's really simple. You hold your hand out like this, you take your other hand, put it in front, and push. Creating this sort of angle, like that. The second stretch, it's the same, except you go the other way, like this. And then, stretch your hand out as far as you can. Like that, as far as you can. And then make a fist, and then punch your screen. Just, just kidding. Now that we're all stretched out, we're ready to try our first chord. C sharp minor add nine. You're gonna start by putting your third finger on the fourth fret of the fifth string, which is C sharp. Then you're gonna put your first finger, it's a big stretch, on the first fret, on the third string. Then you're gonna put your pinky on the fourth fret, on the second string. You play all of the bottom five strings, and it makes that great sound. It's really nice. Second chord is B7 add 13. To play that chord, you're going to start with your middle finger. You're going to place it on the second fret on the fifth string. Then you're going to place your first finger on the first fret, on the fourth string, then your third finger on the string below that, on the second fret, which is just like most of a B7. Then you're gonna stretch your pinky out, 
and play the fourth fret. It's not bad! Now our third chord, A minor 9. To play this chord, you start by placing your ring finger on the third fret on the first string. Then you take your first finger, place it on the first fret on the second string. Then you take your pinky and place it on the fourth fret on the third string. Then you take your second finger and place it on the fourth string on the second fret. And it should sound like this. Now if you can make music with those, you're on to something. Not bad. Maybe they're not so useless after all. Thanks for tuning in. Hi everyone, we're going to play you a couple of work-related songs now. Um, it's been a sad week in particular this week because of the news of John Prine's death. Um, it's a huge loss to the world of music. Um, John Prine obviously didn't exclusively write songs about work, um, but he often wrote about um, the very sort of everyday experiences of, of uh, workers and, and sort of ordinary people. Um, and sometimes he wrote about extraordinary people as well, um, doing uh, their work or living their lives. And um, one of my favorite John Prine songs ever is a, the true story, based on a true story, about a, a young actor from India who um, came to America to make a career um, in the film industry. And uh, and and let's thought we try this, try it anyway. Um, this is a song called "Sabu Visits the Twin Cities Alone." The movie wasn't really doing so hot Said the new producer to the old big shot It's dying on the edge of the great Midwest Sabu must tour all for the rest Hey look, my comes the elephant boy Bundled all up in his corduroy Heading down south towards Illinois From the jungles of East St. Paul The manager sat in his office alone Staring at the numbers on the telephone Wondering how they could send a child actor To visit in the land of the The oven boy, mama got in his corduroy, heading down south to the north from the jungles of East St. Paul. Sabu was sad, the whole tour stuck. The airlines lost the elephant's trunk. Oh, they got the rabies and the scabies and the flu They were low on morale, but they were high on Hey, look, my, here comes the elephant boy Bundled all up in his corner road Heading down south towards the north From the jungles of East St. Paul Hey, look, my, here comes the elephant boy I'd like to sing you a song now from our new record, Never Work. This one's called The Robots vs. Mrs. Patel, and we'd like to send it out to all grocery store workers everywhere. Absolutely, and our friend Sora, mm -hmm. who was the technical consultant on the lyrics. You ready? I'm ready. The year was 2020 And the humans were doing too well 
For instance, take the interesting case of Mrs. Angelique Patel. She worked at the Easy Days supermarket, which gave her no special enjoyment. It was not a good job, but it was a job, and she was grateful to have the employment. It was a Wednesday, but to Mrs. Patel, it was a work day just like any other. She was preoccupied thinking of how she felt guilty about not spending time with her mother. When she arrived at her workplace, she stopped at the sight of something that glittered and gleamed. In place of her usual register was the shiny self-checkout machine. But then all of the normally well-mattered about came words like fucking the hell. And that was the start of the terrible tale of the robots versus Mrs. Patel. Robots versus Mrs. Patel. Her boss was a pencil mustache of a boss. His eyes traveled south like Bosco da Gama. He leered and he jeered and he said with a sneer, Mrs. P, let's not have any drama. This is secure checkout. Autobot 1000. Scout 1000 if you prefer. You'll be training our customers to use it, dealing with problems that may occur. Well, Mrs. Patel thought of strangling him with a lanyard that held her ID card. But she needed the work even more since her husband lost his job as a security guard. And she was spending her evenings in night school learning coding and programming skills. One day soon enough, she thought to herself, I'll get off this wage slavery treadmill. So she opened Scout 1010 to page one and thought to herself, We'll see who owned this model I call the Robots vs. Mrs. Patel. The Robots vs. Mrs. Patel. Customers learn how to use the machines with which they would soon be replaced. Was an irony from which Mrs. Patel and her colleagues found they just could not escape. Some plotted sabotage, some dreamed of a union, but Mrs. Patel knew the truth. When robots and bosses find common causes, there's nothing poor workers can do. Or well, that's what she thought until one fateful evening. Late night advanced coding class, when she learned about strategies known to the nerds as adversarial attacks. So she coded a way to trick the machines to check out atoms that didn't exist, and to charge the day shopping to her boss's account before he knew what he'd missed. So a little algorithm helped to bankrupt the system and the rest of the franchise as well. Continent. The workers all bend in capital's ashes and sing of her accomplishments. And she and her team of rebellious machines are redistributing the wealth. All you bosses and bankers had better beware of the robots and Mrs. Patel. The robots and Mrs. Patel. Wears Me Jumper by Sultans of Ping. My brother knows Karl Marx. He met him eating mushrooms in the People's Park. He said, what do you think 
about my manifesto. I said I like your manifesto. Put it to the testo. He took me down to meet the anarchist party. I met a groovy guy. He was already farty. He said, I know a little Latin, and a kiss, and a kai. I said, I don't know what it means. He said, neither do I. Eat natural foods, bathe twice daily, fill your nostrils up with gravy. Don't drink tea and don't drink coffee, but cover your chin in Yorkshire toffee. Dancing in the disco, bumper to bumper. Wait a minute, where's me jumper? Where's me jumper? Where's me jumper? Where is me jumper? All right. Dancing in the disco. Go, go, go. Dancing in the disco. Oh no, oh no. Cause I was dancing in the disco, bumper to bumper. When, wait a minute, where's me jumper? Where is me jumper? Where is me jumper? Where is me jumper? I know I had it on when I had my tea. And I'm sure I had it on in the lavatory. Oh no, cause I was dancing in the disco. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Pure new wool and perfect stitches. It's not the kind of jumper that makes you itches. Oh no, I was dancing in the disco. Oh, oh, oh. Dancing in the disco. Oh no, oh no. And my mother will be so, so angry. And my brother will be so, so angry. And my girlfriend will be so, so angry. And my dog will be so, so angry. Because I was dancing in the disco, bumper to bumper, when, wait a minute, where's me jumper? Where is me jumper? Where's me jumper? Where is me jumper? All right. Thank you. Hello, welcome to another edition of Ariel Shows You Recipes from the Internet. This week it's Passover and Matthias and I are planning for our Seder meal. There are many important Passover foods, but the most important of all is matzah. Now this famous unleavened bread has been very difficult to find at our local grocery store given that there is a pandemic and also that we live in rural Prince Edward Island. And it's not in high demand right now. But that's okay. We can make it at home by ourselves because I have a recipe that I found on the internet. Matzah commemorates the exodus from Egypt because when the Jews were escaping, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. They must have been doing the 20 hour bread from the New York Times that I did last week. Ha <laughs> ha Anyway, I found a recipe from the New York Times. I like to use the New York Times because my mom gave me her password and I think that anything that's behind a paywall is probably better. Except for this show, of course. Now what we have to do is heat the oven to 500 degrees. I've done that. Now we want to put in two cups of flour. Ooh! I don't really know how to do that gracefully. Uh, salt. How much salt? I'm going to put in that much salt. And a third of a cup of olive oil in a food processor. Do, 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 do. Once the machine is on, you want to add half a cup of water. So here's our matzo. 
lots of dough. Now we want to cut it into 12 equal pieces, which the New York Times says I'm supposed to do half and half and then thirds. So that's what we're going to try and do. Now we want to flatten each one into a patty. Now move these up here. All right. Flattened. Flattened. Now. We want to roll them out as big as we can. We're working a little bit quickly here because technically, I guess, you know, you don't want to take more than 18 minutes with your making of the matzo dough because uh, then, you know, maybe it, natural yeasts start to form and it's no longer unleavened. So I am putting all my incredible strength into this wine bottle to uh, get these nice and thin. Once you have these rolled out, you can get about four on an ungreased cookie sheet, uh, throw a little salt on top, then pop them in the oven at 500 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three minutes. Then uh, you wanna flip them over to the other side for about another minute. You wanna see a little bit of bubbling and a little bit of golden browning, uh, but just a bit. Um, here we go. And here it is, our homemade bread of affliction, AKA matzah. Now it's all ready for the Seder table and for my favorite, matzah ball soup. Hak Sameach, happy Passover, and I hope you'll join me next time on Ariel Shows You Recipes from the Internet. All right, well, I can't believe it's been... What do you do? <laughs> Should we do that? Uh, uh, is that okay? What do we do? Wait. I don't know, I'm no. just trying to like a new thing. That's okay. Like this? Hey, you know, like casual, it's like MTV. Oh, yeah. What's up? What's up? Hey, welcome back. All right. We're doing, we're doing this like we're on a youth broadcast. It's a youth broadcasting station. Oh, we're going like... to play a song, one last song yeah. for the youth of today. Yeah. Right now. This has been a lot of fun being a television, a newly minted television impresario. I don't know how you feel. I about that. yeah, yeah. I love being an impresario. Yeah, I don't know if I'm using the word correctly, but <laughs> feels good. Anyway, we'll play this one last song. And last week on the the show, we asked you uh, to participate with us in advance um, by sending in. Uh, some little clips. That's right. And this week we're asking you to do something else though too. So we're asking you to send something else to us this week. That's true. So uh, we're, we're going to be introducing a new se segment to the show next week called uh, Come On Dog is the Apocalypse. And uh, for that segment we need um, photos of your, your dogs. Um, if you want. You don't need to feel like you have to send them to us. No, no, no. And no. you should ask yeah, the dog's sorry. permission, obviously. I mean, we, ne we need them, but, but you don't have to give them to us. Exactly. That's um, how it works. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you would like to email this email address uh, with a photo of your, your apocalypse friend. Um, and with the name also of your yeah. dog. Yes. Would be good, too. We're going to feature some uh, apocalypse dogs. Some apocalypse dogs next week in a special segment. Uh, but for now, before we go, we'll do this one last song with your help. Um, it was a real pleasure for the last week or so to open up my email every day and get video clips from you of you singing with us to the song. And uh, I've been so excited about this moment right now to sing with all of you. Um, and this is a song that even if you didn't get a chance to send us a clip, you can definitely sing along with at home. You just need to remember the words, pass the wine, fuck the government, I love you. It goes like this. We met at the New Year's party of my vegetarian friend. I said I was studying English. Told you I was in a band. I asked what the band was called. I said it's called the burning hell. 
I said, I've never heard of you. I said, that's probably just as well. Just to make conversation, I told you about a dream I had in which Jean Baudrillard was rapping with public enemies, shouting, don't believe the hype for real, with Flava Flav and Chuck D. And I said, I think we might have a lot in common then, possibly, because I'm also a musician and also a student of your philosophy. You mentioned you used to play the clarinet in high school in the early years of the millennium when you were young. And you said you're hired, the pay is negligible, and the tour starts next month. You asked what I was working on, I said I'm writing an album of love songs. I laughed and said love songs are I said, oh yeah? Wait till you hear these ones. Pass the wine. Fuck the government. I love you. Three statements overheard at once in the crowded room. But I could not be sure which one had come from you. I passed you the wine and said, yes, fuck the government. I love you too. <laughs> Though neither of us are accomplished dancers, we danced a little bit. My vegetarian friend was playing the hits of Will Smith, and we got jiggy with it there on the dance floor. The living room dance floor. That's, that's where it happened. You stole my heart. I stole a kiss. We stole someone, someone else's gin by accident. At some point, we got cornered by an amateur poet, and neither of us knew. Either he had no one else to talk to or could pick up on simple social cues. Step by step, we backed up until we backed up all the way into the bathroom together. We, we told the poet that we always go together. Cause that's, that's what happens when you've been dating forever. We stayed in there for ages, hoping the amateur poet would go. It was awkward. We came out and found it discovered someone else to bother. And suddenly it was midnight, no legs on time countdowns. Gratuitous public making out. And we started shouting, cause everyone else was shouting. And isn't it fun to shout? Pass the wine, fuck the government, I love you. Three statements overheard at once in the crowd. But I could not be sure which one had come from you. So I passed you the wine and said, yes, fuck the government, I love you too. Pass the wine, fuck, fuck the, the government, government. I, I love you. Three statements overheard at once in the crowd. But I could not be sure which one had come from you. So I passed you the wine and said, yes, fuck the government. I love you too.